Hi guys, welcome to my channel and another Inktober video. We are well over halfway now, but now is the time when some people might start to flag, lose interest and think about giving up. So in today's video, I'm going to give you some positive vibes as well as some fun facts about the things I'm painting. I thought this might keep things fresh and interesting, so I hope you enjoy the video. If you want to catch up on my other Inktober videos where I've talked about the ink painting techniques I've used and how I came up with my ideas using the official prompt list, then I'll link those at the end of this video. All the materials I use will also be listed in the description box if you want to go and check them out. And before I start, I also wanted to mention that I'll be adding six more original ink paintings from last year's Inktober to my Etsy shop, so watch to the end to take a look at those. Okay, so let's get started with day 19 and the word prompt was sling. And to start with, all I could think of was those triangular shaped bandages that you use to support your arm when you've hurt it. And I didn't fancy drawing that, so then I thought of a slingshot or even a baby sling. And off the back of that, I thought of a baby kangaroo in its mother's pouch. It doesn't completely fit the prompt, but the way I see it is that a prompt is just that something to help you come up with ideas. There's no right or wrong and there's no Inktober police that I'm aware of. So if you're finding the prompts tricky, then either be a bit inventive with your interpretation or draw something different that day. It's all good and besides, I was far more inspired to paint these kangaroos than I was to paint a bandage or a slingshot. So female kangaroos are pregnant for only 21 to 28 days before giving birth and the baby kangaroo or joey when it's born is guided into the mother's pouch where it just stays for a further 7 to 10 months. Which struck me as pretty bizarre as it's a bit like having a baby and keeping it in your pocket. But inside the mother's pouch the joey will attach to the mother's teat and stay cosy and safe until it grows big enough to hop out. The babies do wee and poop in the pouch too, which isn't too much of a problem when they're first born, but as they get bigger, the mum will turf them out so she can clean it. Interesting. Now kangaroos don't walk on two legs, although they can walk around slowly on four, they mostly jump, and they're pretty good at it too. I was amazed to learn that a kangaroo can leap 30 foot in distance and 10 foot in height, so it could easily jump over my head, twice. They're fast too, and can reach the speed of 56 kilometers per hour or 35 miles per hour through jumping, but, and this is a random fact, kangaroos can't walk backwards. You can't have it all I suppose, but they are excellent swimmers. In the water, they can move their hind legs individually, and if attacked, they will sometimes get in the water to try and drown their predator. Now something I always like to know is the name given to groups of animals. So a group of kangaroos is called a mob, herd or troop. And whilst baby kangaroos are called joeys, female kangaroos are called flyers and males are called boomers. I really enjoyed doing this painting and got a really nice bright effect with the background just by using cotton buds to lift up some ink. I built up several layers to get the values I wanted and finished off by adding some darker branches with my dip pen and some leaves in the foreground to create depth. For day 20, the prompt was tread. I thought of the tread on tyres and shoes, but decided to paint some birds' footprints on the beach. So far as composition goes, I thought it would be fun to paint it as a bird's eye view, looking down from above, with the sea on the left and some palm trees on the right. I'm telling you that because I don't think it's immediately obvious from the painting, and I don't think it worked that well. But I did get to practice painting water, sand and leaves all in one painting, so there was that. With all the rain and mud around at the moment though, I could have used lots of real life reference material from my dog's muddy footprints all over the place, but I've seen quite enough of those for now. So you can tell a lot about an animal's footprints by their shape, size and number of toes or claws and so on. And there are many guides available to help you identify what animals are out there just by their footprints. 
One I'd particularly recommend you look up if you're interested is the American Coot, which have long toes wrapped in skin to help them swim, but still walk on land. Now, I don't know about you, but I've always got cold feet, and it got me thinking about whether birds and animals get cold feet too, especially when it snows. I learnt that most animals have adaptations to help them adjust to the cold winter months, which include extra padding in their paws to prevent them getting frostbite. Some birds, such as Canadian geese, even have a built-in heating system for their feet. The blood vessels carrying warm blood from the bird's heart are able to transfer heat to the cooler blood moving from the feet back to the heart, so keeping their feet warm and helping to maintain body temperatures. Other birds that hang around rather than migrate in colder months have light hollow bones which put less weight on the snow, whilst heavier birds like wild turkeys or vultures have wide feet with claws that act a bit like snowshoes, dispersing their weight over a greater area. For me though, I'll just have to wear an extra pair of socks. To finish off my painting and add some much needed contrast to this one, I used some white gel pen, some brown fine liner and added another layer of ink to those leaves. On to day 21 and the word prompt was treasure, and there are lots of treasures in nature but the one I chose was a pearl in an oyster. After struggling a bit with composition and contrast the day before, I was determined to come up with a piece today that had a bit more scope to work with. I used a reference picture from Pixabay for the oyster, but added some different seaweeds around it so it looked a bit more like hidden treasure on the seabed. So how are these treasures made and what are the chances of finding one? Well, pearls are made by both marine and freshwater mussels as a natural defence against an irritant, such as a parasite or a grain of sand entering their shell, or as a result of damage to their fragile body. They are the only jewels created by a living animal and the chances of finding a natural pearl is pretty low at 1 in 12,000. But you can get cultured pearls too, where harvesters insert small irritants into the oyster to induce pearl growth. Although cultured pearls are usually of equal quality, they aren't as expensive because they're not as rare. And despite what we may think, pearls aren't just white either. They can be grey, red, blue, green and even black. But it turns out that all pearl oysters are born male and transform into females at around 3 years of age and mother of pearl is made from the oyster shell, which I didn't know. So how do you tell a real pearl from a fake one? There are lots of different ways, but a couple of interesting ones are to test for the slightly rough or gritty texture that real pearls have. And you can feel this by rubbing the pearls together, or even rubbing them on your teeth, so I read, although I wouldn't recommend this. Real pearls won't be perfectly smooth. They're also very rarely perfectly round, and real pearls won't roll in a straight line on a flat surface. When I was painting my pearl, I did try to get it more round than it turned out, but as luck would have it, it turns out it's more natural and realistic that way. I'm pleased with how this one turned out and like the rough texture I got on the shell by using the dry brush technique. Day 22 and the word was ghost, and without feeling too inspired I painted a ghost pepper or ghost chilli, but I'm not going to spend too long on this one as it was a bit of a hot mess. I still need to practice painting leaves though, and despite being unhappy with how it turned out as a finished piece, I view it as one step closer to getting it right, so it still has a place and a purpose in this week's lineup. So the heat of peppers and chilies is measured on the Scoville scale which starts off at zero Scoville heat units with a regular bell pepper and goes up to over 15 million with pure capsaicin. The ghost pepper, or boot jalokia, comes in at 855,000 to 1 million SHUs, which is still below US grade police pepper spray at 2.5 to 5.3 million SHU. In fact, ghost peppers have been made into military grade smoke bombs. 
But if you happen to eat one or any hot and spicy foods, don't reach for the water. Instead, try a glass of milk, a slice of lemon or even a spoonful of sugar, apparently. But milk is good as it contains casein, a protein which neutralizes the capsaicin which is the source of the burning. So moving swiftly on to day 23 and the prompt was ancient. This was another fun one as I got to paint a giant tortoise. Some giant tortoises can live for more than 250 years, but their life expectancy is usually between 80 to 120 years, which is still pretty ancient. From the species Gigantia, the Aldabra giant tortoise is found on Aldabra Island in the Seychelles, a place that I've always dreamed of visiting. Giant tortoise eggs are about the size of tennis balls and are buried in moist sand or loose soil, but it takes about 20 years to reach breeding size. And the warmer the sand, the more females that are likely to hatch. Because these are tortoises and not turtles, they don't need to be in water and can actually go quite a length of time without it, as most of the water they need comes from their herbivorous diet. In fact, I read that Galapagos tortoises can go for a whole year without food or water, since their bodies start breaking down their body fat, which produces water as a byproduct. That beats the camel, which can only go about seven months without water. Speaking of food and diet, giant tortoises don't have teeth, but their jaws are lined with horny sharp ridges, which come together like a pair of garden shears. If a person offered them food and misjudged it, they could easily lose a finger. But what about that huge shell? It must weigh a ton. Well, the female shell of a Galapagos tortoise averages about 250 pounds, while the larger male shell can weigh more than double that. That's about 35 stones in old weight, just for the shell. It's interesting to know though that the shell is not solid. Instead, it's made up of honeycomb-shaped air chambers. Maybe that's why they make a hissing noise when they pull their heads back into their shells. In any case, I really enjoyed this one and was pleased with how it turned out. So on to the last painting for today's video and the prompt for day 24 is Dizzy. I only had a few ideas for this one, the first was a dog or animal chasing its tail and making itself dizzy, but I'm conscious that I've painted more animals than nature for my animals and nature theme this month. So I went with the other option I thought of, the Dizzy Lily or Oriental Lily. I also wanted to try and put into practice what I'd learnt from day 8 when I painted the frail petals of a winter jasmine. This time I wanted to make sure I had a much lighter pencil sketch from the start so it wouldn't be visible at the end and ruin the overall look of the piece. I also wanted the composition to be a bit more interesting so I painted a closer up picture with more detail. I'm much happier with this one compared with day 8's painting so it just goes to show that practice does mean progress and making art that you don't like can help your future art. So don't despair if you've done paintings you're not happy with whether ink table or not, as the next one will probably be better. Now I really love lilies, but the one thing I don't like about them is the pollen, as it really stains clothes or soft furnishings. The orange yellow pigment in lily pollen is a fat soluble carotenoid. To get it out of fabric, you should definitely not add water or touch it, but instead you should shake it off or lift it off gently with a piece of tape. Alternatively, you can cut off the anthers bearing the pollen before you put the lilies on display. This is what I tend to do as I've learnt the hard way, having had lily pollen stain my curtains. One thing I really enjoyed about this painting, rather surprisingly for me, is the leaves. These beautiful dark leaves have a really lovely vein structure, and I think this helped to add contrast to the piece as a whole. I tried not to overdo the background, keeping it much lighter than in my jasmine painting, and I think it turned out okay. Let me know in the comments which of this week's paintings you like the best, and let me know how you're getting on with Inktober if you're taking part too. 
There's only seven days of paintings to go and I'm really excited for next week's video as there's going to be a bit of a surprise. And I'm also hoping to upload an extra video tomorrow as well. If you like this video please give it a big thumbs up, comment and subscribe and hit the bell icon too to be notified as soon as I upload a new video. I'll leave you with the next set of original ink paintings going up in my Etsy shop today and I'll leave a link below if you want to go and take a closer look. Have a lovely evening, take care, stay positive and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!